right, good evening, everybody. It's great to see everyone out tonight. Thank you for joining us in our midweek study. Also, a big thank you to Tyler for filling in for me on Sunday morning when I was out of town. Definitely appreciate him doing that. And if you'd like to follow along with the main text tonight, we'll be looking at the first part of Genesis chapter 12. So if you want to open there, Genesis chapter 12 is where we'll begin in just a minute. And before we do that, let's bow in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity we have to be together as a congregation and to take a look at your word. We're so thankful, Lord, for what your word teaches us, how it reveals you to us. We're so thankful for your love for us that even though um, we as humanity had made a mess of your perfect world and that each of us individually has done that in our own lives, that you still loved us and pursued us and made a way for us to be made right with you. We're so grateful for that, Lord. We are grateful for your son, Jesus the Christ. Pray that tonight that we will... Um, understand anew uh, your plan for him, your love for us, and uh, the great things that you have done throughout history. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so if you are just joining our class, we started a week ago um, in a study of the theme of the Bible, and we are taking a look at the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And it's not an exhaustive study. We're not going into every book or every chapter of the books that we hit, but rather we're taking a very high-level view of the Bible as a whole and hoping to trace through the Bible the theme, the main point um, of the inspired text. We talked about how the theme is like a melody line, and once you hear the melody line, once you hear just the main music of the song, suddenly you see it appearing everywhere. And that main melody line we saw come up in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis that we'll see eventually uh, at the end of June, at the end of Revelation. You can see that same music being played um, throughout the Bible. And certainly tonight is one of those key moments uh, in uh, biblical history where we see, definitely see that theme coming through strong, and that's in God's promises to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. But before we jump into Genesis chapter 12, I just want to take a couple minutes to talk about what we've seen so far over the last week and a half in the book of Genesis. So here we go, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, about the creation of the world. We know that God created the heavens and the earth, and the Bible says that everything was very good. God creates people in his image, different than the rest of creation, but still part of it creates people in his image, and they are to multiply and fill the earth. That part of the commandment is important, as we'll see in a few minutes. Adam and Eve, at the time, are in perfect fellowship with God and with one another. They're living in this paradise where they are completely naked but completely unashamed. Um, They are exposed and yet completely safe. Uh, They are known and completely loved, and God simply asks them to trust him. God says, gives them a lot of freedom, a lot of room for creativity, but he tells them there's one thing they cannot do. We talked about how what he explains to them, they likely did not fully understand. They had no concept of the things that God was talking to them about, but they had a concept about God, and that was enough. They knew who God was, and they needed to trust him, and sadly, um, they did not. So this world of perfection we see in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 turns into the world of Genesis chapters 3 through 11, and we are now in a world marred by sin and idolatry. So Adam and Eve sinned first, and then we didn't talk about this specifically, but if you trace kind of the history after that, they have children, and one of their sons murders another one of their sons. Um, The world becomes full of violence, and then Tyler talked about this on Sunday. God punishes evil and renews the earth by having a worldwide flood. After the flood, things don't 
get any better, sadly. It's a fresh start, but um, shortly after the flood is over, the same problems of sin come about, and people build the Tower of Babel. And if you think back to what we said a minute ago about God asking Adam and Eve to care for his creation, and part of that was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, that was part of the problem with the Tower of Babel, because rather than obeying that command and spreading everywhere, people said, nope. We're going to stay right here. And rather being humble and submissive to the commands of God, they say, we're going to stay here, and we're going to build a really big thing, and it's going to make a really big deal about us. And, of course, in response to that, God disperses people all across the face of the earth. And so that is the world marred by sin, and as we see through uh, various parts in here, marred by idolatry, um, whether it be serving, as we'll see with Abraham's family, serving, you know, idols like statues and things like that, um, or whether it be the idolatry of Eve that we talked about in the Garden of Eden in terms of what she placed on the throne above God. Um, but it is a world marked uh, by idolatry in the sense that God is not given the proper place that he should have and is a world uh, marred by sin, um, even after the flood. And it's worth pointing out that that is the world that Abraham lives in. Um, and I know that uh, when we start to read in chapter 12, he's called Abram rather than Abraham. We just have to cut me some slack because we mostly know him as Abraham, and I'm just probably going to end up using those terms interchangeably. So, same person. Um, but that is the world that Abraham lives in, a world marred by sin. But, as we've seen all along, the theme of the Bible shows that God has not abandoned his creation. So every time something bad happens, we see that there is a response on the part of God. So Satan tempts and deceives Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. But also in Genesis chapter 3, God promises to Adam and Eve that he will defeat Satan. Adam and Eve are ashamed. We talked about, you know, they're naked, they're ashamed, they blame one another, they're terrified of God. God responds by clothing them. The world becomes full of sin. God responds by renewing the world with the flood. And people around the world deserve punishment, but God responds by saving Noah, a man who sought to follow God in faith. So, as we can see, as all the bad things on the left side of the slide keep happening, at the same time, these responses by God on the right side of the slide are happening as well. And we see, going through all of this, the unfolding of the story. Right? So in Genesis, of course, it's pretty blurry at the beginning. You don't know what's going on, but finally we'll see once we get to um, the Gospels, it will be crystal clear, and certainly in the epistles, as this is explained, um, God's plan all along to respond to the rebellion of his creation, um, a plan that was in place before the foundations of the world, and that is um, saving people by grace through faith, through Jesus, um, the Messiah. So that's what we've seen so far. Any comments or questions about um, anything we covered the last, last several classes? First part of Genesis. Okay, great. So let's jump into then learning about Abram. And um, before we get into Genesis chapter 12, I'd like three volunteers, please. We're going to read just these these uh, passages in succession here and then talk a little bit about Abram's background so we know what's going on. So could I have a volunteer please to read um, Genesis chapter 11 verses 27 through 32. Volunteer for that. Dane, in just a second, you can kick things off. Joshua 24, 1 through 3. Anybody? Matt, you mind doing that one, please? Thanks. And then um, Acts chapter 7. Volunteer to read that. Okay, we'll do Acts chapter 7. Um, Eric will get that last. So, all right, go ahead. Genesis chapter 11, please.
All right, Joshua 24. Chapter 7, please. Thank you. So we have here in Genesis chapter 11 kind of the genealogy of Abram's family and some description about some of their early moves um, and discussion of who his relatives are. And then in Joshua and Acts, we have descriptions of the family of Abram as well, given at different times. So Joshua is talking to the people of Israel many centuries after this, and he's explaining to them, hey, here's um, what it was like for Abraham, our father, and then even further in the future, Stephen, um, when he is speaking in Acts chapter 7, describes Abraham as well. But I wanted to read all three of these because they give kind of a big picture, a complete picture about what Abraham's family was like. And I'm going to throw up some things up here on the slide, and then maybe we can talk about it a little bit. Uh, but first, Abram, he, both his land and his people were in Mesopotamia. And in Acts chapter 7, it emphasized both that, both his land and his kindred. So it's the idea of maybe where his house was, the land he owned, um, as well as his family roots, right, his um, relatives. All these people were elsewhere in Mesopotamia. Um, and his family served other gods. His father did, uh, his extended family did. Um, his family um, served multiple gods, none of which were the one true and living God. God called him um, when he was, apparently he was called twice. Uh, we, we see that from Genesis chapter 11, and then in Acts chapter 7 adds more detail to this. But early on, when they were in Ur of the Chaldeans, God called him to both go out and go in. So he called him to leave one area, and then called him to go into another. His family begins to go, led by his father, but they settle in Haram. They don't make it all the way um, to Canaan. And at that point, where he's kind of halfway there, God calls him again, and he is 75 years old, we'll see in chapter 12 at this point. Um, so that's a little bit of background about the man um, named Abram, later Abraham. So what do, you, what do you think life is like for him? It's based on what we read or seeing these points. I mean, what, what's life like for this man, Abram? Or what jumps out to you about his past? Anything you maybe never really thought about before? Yes. Big change. You're exactly right. When we think about Abraham today, you think of one of those big characters of the Old Testament, you think, well, of course, you know, he's the friend of God. Uh, but we find out that his family served multiple false gods, and God called him out of that. And as Ben said, that would be very difficult um, for him to make that change. I think there was another hand over here. Yes.
Yeah, and I think it's in Hebrews that says that not only does God call him, God calls him to a land that he does not know. He doesn't know where he's going. Um, he just knows he's supposed to go. Um, and so this is a big change for him. I mean, he was from Mesopotamia. And some of us in this room have moved a lot. Some of us have moved maybe one or two times. Some of us haven't moved at all, right? But, for, um, but I think for all of us, we understand the, the big deal with moving, right? Moving states, moving countries, right? This is a huge deal for him. Very difficult to leave behind, not just his home, but his people, and everything about his heritage um, in terms of the paganism and things like that. And, and we aren't told exactly what happened, but it's interesting that um, Stephen says God called Abraham to go, um, and then they kind of went with the extended family, like with his father. Presumably, he'd have to say, hey, dad, <laughs> you imagine having this conversation, um, God appeared to me and uh, told me to go there. And, uh, but somehow uh, the, the family started to go, right, uh, together. And then his father, Terah, dies um, in Haran. And um, that's where the family then stays put for that moment. And Abraham stays there until he's 75 years old. And I think that's worth pointing out as well because um, he's not a young guy, right? I mean, you think about, oh, maybe he was like 15, a little impetuous, you know, he's like, I'm going out on my own, you know, type of thing. That's not the case, right? This is not just some kind of youthful exuberance or excitement. He is 75 years old, um, and he started to go, and then he stopped, um, and then his dad died, and then we'll see that God calls him a second time um, to go all the way. And in case you're curious, just in terms of geography, and I know a lot of the points are kind of small on this map to see far away, but hopefully you just get an idea of big picture. Mediterranean Sea, right? Um, so this would be Egypt, um, Palestine, you know, ancient Israel, all that stuff right there. Um, and here's the uh, Euphrates and the Tigris River. So where he was going eventually was the land of Canaan, right down here, where Israel eventually will be. And where he's from is Ur of the Chaldees. And if you'd like some exciting homework, you can spend a lot of time reading about where Ur of the Chaldees might be. The quick answer is nobody knows. Um, but uh, historically, it seemed people thought it was up in this direction. In the early 1900s, there was a gentleman who um, did a lot of archaeology work in the city of Ur. So people are split. Some people, and if, in fact, if you look in the back of your Bible, many of them have maps. It's probably a 50-50 split in terms of where the little arrows go from down here or from up here. Um, some people say, well, this is the city of Ur, so this must be Ur of the Chaldees. Others say, well, Chaldees actually didn't live down there, so it was kind of like saying, I went to Miami. 99% of people say Miami, Florida, right, the hurricanes. But you say Miami of Ohio, a different Miami, right? And so Ur of the Chaldees, Chaldees lived up here. People think maybe up there. Not, doesn't matter either way uh, for this class, but uh, he came from somewhere in Mesopotamia. He's taught from the land on the other side of the river, so that is the Euphrates River right here, right? So the land on the other side of the river, and um, here's Haran where he settled. So they came from somewhere down here, up here, and made it all the way to Haran and stopped um, until his father passed away. And that's where we'll pick up here in um, Genesis chapter 12. So could I have a volunteer, please? Um, to read the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12. What? Uh, go ahead. Okay, verses um, that I'm sure are well known to many here. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 are some key promises to Abraham. So what are, um, what are some of these promises? What's the first thing that he talks to them, uh, talks to Abram about? Go where? To what? The land? 
land I will show you. Yeah. So he says, go to the land that I will show you. Um, and so implicit in that is that there will be a land to go to, right? The first promise is that there is a destination, Abram, that I have in mind for you. You don't know what it is. You don't know exactly when you're going to be there, but I will show this to you. Um, and uh, that's the promise that he will show him this land. Um, what else is a promise here? Verse 2. Exactly, a great nation. I will make of you a great nation. Why is that a big, a big thing? I mean, some will think the first promise, I mean, that's really big, right? Go and I'll show you some land, but great nation, why is that big? Yeah. So he's left kind of one country, and he's promised uh, that he will uh, become another country. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah, and um, we'll see. He travels. They have, um, we'll read surely the people they brought with him, but it's him and Sarah, as well as um, various people said that they acquired. Um, but those aren't kids, right? The servants, uh, family member, uh, small family with servants um, and other things like that. And he's an old guy. And before the kids come, we'll see he's going to get uh, even older. So certainly telling a 75-year-old um, that uh, you are going to be the father of a nation would be fairly surprising. Um, was there another hand? Okay. So, okay. Um, so that's it. What's the third promise? Great. Yeah, that he'll bless him. And there will be, in fact, there's two halves to this. One is very specific for Abram, and one is broader for others. What's the specific aspect of this in terms of how Abram's going to be blessed? Is it just a, and you'll have a happy life. There's kind of, and you will be blessed. What does God tell him? Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, it's very specific. Basically, God says, you, anyone who treats you well is on my side, like on God's side, and will be blessed. And people who don't treat you well are my enemies, and they will not be blessed which is a pretty amazing thing if you think about it, uh, that God's saying to a specific individual, how other people treat you will determine how I, God, treat those people, um, which is a pretty am amazing statement. And then what's the other half of the blessing promise? Well, there's the curses. Yeah, so people, if, you, if, you if they bless you, they'll bless, curse you, I'll curse them. And then what's broader even beyond Abram? Yeah, all families shall be blessed. And so it says, um, and in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Um, now, who knows? <laughs> the first thing that came into Abraham's mind when he heard that, but that's a pretty, I mean, from a human perspective, outrageous statement, right? If somebody came up to you, now, I know this is God speaking, so, uh, and Abraham, faith in God, um, so it's a different matter. But imagine if someone came up to you and they said, hey, just so you know, everyone on planet Earth is blessed because of me, right? If that was your kid, if that was your 16-year-old son who said that to you, the next words out of your mouth would not be blessings, right? They would be, go to your room until you knock off that attitude, right? Um, because we would say, like, that's so crazy to think, right? I mean, that if someone would say that about themselves, it would be tremendously arrogant, right? To say, well, hey, I'm, I'm the source of all blessings for everyone on planet Earth. I mean, that's, that's pretty bold. Now, that's not Abram saying about himself. It's God saying it about Abraham. And can you imagine? You're 75 years old. Right? Here you are, you've already left your home and you made it to another city. You're sitting there and you're told, all right, remember, there's this land, go to this land. 
and you are going to be the start of a brand new country and I'm going to take care of you and I'm friends with who you're friends with and I'm enemies who you're enemies with and not only that everyone on planet earth is blessed because it will be blessed through you how would you respond if you were told these things <laughs> yeah and maybe that's the best way there would be nothing to say right you just you just uh, you hear what God says and like Okay, um, but uh, we'll see on the next slide here how Abraham, how he responds with his actions. Um, but in the moment, it must have been amazing for him to hear these things. Um, but I think the key is for all these promises that God is telling him there is something better out there, right? That there are these promises to this man whose family practices idolatry, say, hey, leave that stuff. And come where I show you, and if you do, there will be amazing things that I will do for you if you follow me, right? These are promises to Abram saying, if you leave what I told you to leave, and you go where I told you to go, there will be these amazing blessings for you. All right, any final thoughts, comments about that before we keep moving here? Yes. Yeah, great question. And who knows, right? I mean, I, I, who knows? Um, and certainly, you, know, you think back through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, um, you'd imagine um, Cain and Abel, you know, his generation would have known perhaps a lot about what happened because hopefully their parents would have told them, right? And we know from shortly after um, Cain and Abel, you know, as, as the next few generations are, are born, there's that phrase that people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. So people were searching after God. Um, you think after the flood and Noah, the first few generations would, you know, like, hey, understand more. But who knows, right? By the time it was Abraham, um, who knows what, what level of detail, if any, of understanding he had, right, of uh, Jehovah, so to speak. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, but certainly his family was not um, living as a family that understood and had faith in the one true God. Um, and so whether what he may have known or heard or what he thought was like, you know, history or mixed with idolatry, that's a great, great point. But um, we, so we don't know what he's thinking. But we know what he did. So let's take a look then at verses 4 through 9. Could I have a volunteer, please? Keep going here in chapter 12, verses 4 through 9. Go ahead.
thank you for getting through all the uh, different difficult place names um, in there. So we know what God promised Abram in verses 1 through 3. And so here we see in verses 4 through 9, Abram's response to those promises. And the first um, thing is, we're told, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. Very simple statement. But what do you take from that? God gives him all these grand promises. And then the next thing the Bible tells us is, so Abram went. What's that show? Yeah, he trusts the Lord. This is, this is faith, right? This is the definition of faith right here, that he believes God and he acts on that belief. It'd be one thing for him to say, hmm, that's interesting. But he didn't just think about it. Or one thing to tell Sarah, you know, Sarah, I think, you know, maybe we retire in Canaan. Maybe, you know, by this time next spring, you know, we can go down by the Mediterranean. It's supposed to be nicer down there. It'd be good for our old age, you know. Um, none of that, you know. Or it's kind of half-hearted. Well, well, you know, maybe we'll all go explore a little bit, see what it's like, come back and get, you know, Sarah. No, he goes. Wayne, did you have your hand up? Very impressive, right? Uh, what a great example. And sometimes, you know, when we think about the Bible or the concepts like faith and obedience, it, we make it really complicated, but faith is very straightforward, right? You hear God, I hear God, and then I obey, right? I believe him and I act on that um, belief. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Easy to read. Not easy to do, right? What did he say to Sarah? What did Sarah say to him, <laughs> right? Um, what's, uh, how did he figure all this out, right? I mean, it's very, um, we don't know, but uh, there's a lot in that, um, but he did it. And notice that it says he took everything with him. It says he took his wife, Lot, his brother's son, you know, his father had passed away, so he's taking the family that is with him, there with him, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people they had acquired, acquired in here. Why is that significant? They took all his stuff with them. What's that show? The commitment? Yeah. There's no going back, right? He's like, I'm going. It's not that he said, well... I'll leave some stuff behind. I am going. Now, maybe you've had this experience um, when you've moved to places life. Maybe, you know, when you're younger, let's say you leave uh, to go to college or your first job, you leave your parents' house for the first time. Did you take all your stuff with you from your parents' house? I see all the parents uh, still in the basement, right? Yeah, the stuff's still there, right? Because presumably you know you're going to go back. Now, you may, you may live there. You may not live there, right? Five years, you know, may boomerang back, right, you know, and, and be there for a while in between jobs. But eventually, right, you're going to move out. But you're always like, well, I can always go back, right, and get my stuff, you know, because it's, it's kind of a still a place you go back for holidays and stuff like that. Now, maybe when you're older, and you're, let's say you live one place and you get a job transfer somewhere else, did you leave stuff behind? No, right? The moving van comes. If it is, doesn't fit in the van, it goes in the trash, right? Or goes to Goodwill. Because the van is going down I-75, right? And whatever's in it is going, right? Because you sold your house, you can't go back. Right? So Abram is more of the latter scenario, right? This isn't where he's like, well, I'm going to kind of leave a, a, in my house here. I'm going to have a second house down by the Mediterranean Sea. Or maybe Sarah's going to stay here and we'll kind of split our time between these areas. Or maybe I'll leave some servants behind. It's, nope, everything's packed. If we want it, it's going, right? And that just simply emphasizes the level of his obedience. Um, and then notice once he gets to this land and God again tells him to your offspring, I will give this land, how does he respond to God? Yeah. He worships God. 
Exactly. He is, he worships God. Why is that significant? Okay. Or what's that show about his character? Any thoughts? Yeah. I know. What do you think? Yeah. Well, it seems to me at a minimum he's realizing the promises from God. I trust God. I'm going to obey God. And now here I'm in this new land. I need God, right? You know, I mean, I'm far from home. I, and as we learn through the rest of the account here in Genesis of Abram, it's tough going for him. And a lot of times in Abram, sometimes it's really nice and he does get really wealthy. Um, but there are some pretty frightening moments as well. And so I think it just shows... He's all in, he recognizes he's all in, and he's completely dependent on God. And he, res and he responds to that by worshiping God and seeking to, to please God, right? Um, and uh, I think it just shows a lot about his character. He acknowledges his dependence on God. Um, and um, perhaps even some of this is asking for help. Perhaps some of this is thanksgiving because he's made it into the land at that point. Perhaps some of this is honoring God because he's realizing these promises are true, right? Here I am in the land that God said. Um, but whatever it was, it was, it was a focus on God in building uh, these altars. And it says in verse eight, calling upon the name of the Lord. All right, other comments about Abram's response here before we talk a little bit about us. Oh, yes. Great point. Yes. sure there's a lot of danger a lot of unknowns um and uh you imagine someone from mesopotamia who is going through a situation like that what would they naturally have wanted to do where would they have turned where would abram's father and grandfather have turned in times of difficulty in mesopotamia yeah to idols right i mean that's why people have idols right it isn't like you're sitting in your house and you're thinking, oh, I'm bored, I know, let me carve something, right? I mean, that's not what's going on with an idol. You may carve something else, right? But you're not going to worship it. So when do, how do you transition from, well, I made something to I worship this thing? It's because you're scared, right? Or you need help, or you're sick, or you're lonely, or there was a loved one that's now gone, and, or you know, war is on the horizon. You need someone to protect yourself, right? And so you think about Abram, he is leaving the idols of his family's past, he's trying to follow now this one true God who's speaking to him, all these dangers around him, the things he probably used to turn to or his family would turn to for security and success, right, and blessings, um, he does not turn to anymore. Yes.
yeah. Um, but I think the key is that focus is now on God, right, versus the things across the river. So as we conclude here, let's think a little bit about us um, in terms of how what lessons we can learn from this. Um, you know, God calls us very similar to how he calls Abram, or he called Abram. He calls us to leave our idolatrous lives and go to a new life that he will show us. And as we talked about a minute ago, that's a day-by-day -day thing. Just as Abram said, all right, we're going to walk as far as we can today and then camp for the night. That is our lives today, right? If we have heard God's call through the Bible, if we said in faith, I'm going to follow God, we're leaving the idols behind, whatever those idols have been in our family's background or our background, we're saying, I'm done with that stuff, I'm throwing in completely for God, it's a day-by-day -day commitment that we're going to go toward this new life that God has promised to show us. And at the same time, God has promised us incredible blessings, incredible blessings, um, if we will simply follow him. And so the question for us is, will we have faith and go? Right? Will we have faith and obey God? Um, that's the question for us individually. And then the question for us kind of worldwide, okay, do we have faith? Do we go? How do we go? Is, of course, through Jesus. So the lessons for Abram are kind of twofold. One, you can think of for us personally, in terms of having that commitment, that faith to leave idols behind in our lives and follow after God. And then you think of the great promise to, to Abram about through, all, through him all families of the earth will be blessed, talking again about Jesus, right? That kind of blurry picture of Jesus at this point. What is God talking about, right? Well, we know because of the rest of the Bible that he is saying through Abraham's descendants will come one who will allow all people to be blessed, have the opportunity to be blessed um, by God. And we know today that that man was Jesus. Right? Fully man, fully God. God's plan for his only begotten son to come to this world um, to die in our behalf so that we can be forgiven of our sins. And we know that um, as God has called us to leave our old ways behind and has promised blessings to us, those blessings are available through his son because of what his son did on, on our behalf. So that's uh, the theme of the Bible as uh, kind of the next uh, phrase, phase here, Genesis chapter 12. Next, we'll talk about Genesis 28 and uh, Jacob's dream. Any final comments about Abram, um, the promises? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, it, it seems like there was something that made Abram say, no, this is, this is what's true, right? And I'm leaving this behind. Um, and I think you could say the same for us today, right? I mean, when we look at God's word um, as it burns in our hearts, we know, right, this is true. But then the question is, am I going to do it or am I going to, right, uh, not do it? But a great thought. Yes. in Egypt, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he certainly um, revealed tremendous faith, you know, like we talked about with the sacrifice of Isaac. And I think also, um, I know we're about to get buzzed here, but I think it's worth pointing out the, the mercy and grace of God, right? Because Abram was not a perfect man, and like what happened down in Egypt and stuff like that. Um, but just as God did not abandon Adam and Eve, um, God did not abandon all people, like when he allowed Noah to be saved, he does not abandon Abraham through the ups and downs of his life, right? And that's, um, uh, so it's a testament to Abram's faith, but it's also a testament to God's faithfulness to his own promises. Um, it's uh, just incredible. All right, thanks for all the comments. Uh, appreciate it, class. And we will see you all Sunday morning.
tonight for the invitation, I'm going to talk about a slogan that I picked up in my early 20s. It is called Vision to See, Faith to Believe, and Courage to Do. I've used this throughout my career in my spiritual family and business life. Of course, the family and business life have to match the spiritual life also. It should have the same values. Tonight we'll be talking about the spiritual life. The first thing we want to talk about in this slogan is vision to see. Without vision, there is no hope. Hope is our expectations. Hope comes from God's word and promises found in the scriptures. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people are un unrestrained. We have, to focus our, we have to focus on above and not the things below. To be successful, we must focus and meditate on God's words daily. It takes vision to see God's plan, which unfolds from Genesis through Revelations. Without a vision for our future, we can lose sight of where we are going. How can we never lose sight of our heavenly goal? The answer is found in Paul's inspired counsel in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, if you want to turn to those. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter uh, 4, verses 16 through 18. This is motivation of external perspective. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light of affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us as far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, temporary but the things which are not seen are external. We must focus on the unseen vision. Always take me to, we must focus on the unseen. My visions always take me to Revelations chapter 20, the great white throne judgment, in Revelations 21, the new heaven and the new earth are created. This is my motivation to persevere for eternal life. Pro Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 say and tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. We must always pray and have God direct us in our daily decisions we make. He will always lead us in the way best for us. We may not always have great, great and good vision to know why, but we always must execute his way if we want to be successful and get to heaven. The next thing on this slogan is faith to believe. Romans 11, 17 tells us, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Hebrews 11.7 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We must put our trust in God's word to be successful. The last part of this slogan is courage to do. Does our courage carry us to do God's will when those around us are doing wrong? Does our courage carry us to be obedient to God's commandments, statutes, and laws, regardless of the consequences? Is our courage like Daniel, Daniel's, who was thrown in the lion's den for not submitting to the governor to, de to the governor's decree, Daniel chapter six? I ask you tonight: Does your vision, faith, and courage? bring you to follow the steps of salvation, to become a child of God, or anything else we can help you with. If so, come forward as we sing.
just a minute. Nolan uh, will lead us in our closing prayer. Have some that are visiting with us. We are very thankful that you are here. Meet again this Sunday at 10 o'clock for Bible study, 10.50 for worship, and 5 o'clock Sunday evening for worship. I want to start off with a good announcement, um, the best that you can give. Isaac Greenwood obeyed the gospel uh, last night and certainly are thankful for that. Unfortunately, there's some sickness in the family, so that's why they're not here. But uh, he obviously has chosen to... Uh, start following our our God and so we're certainly thankful for that so please remember him in your prayers uh, hopefully he'll be able to be here on Sunday but um, please encourage him if you have the opportunity so again Isaac Greenwood obeyed the gospel uh, Bruce Hastings was taken to the ER has gone to the ER because of a high blood pressure so we need to remember him it's Lee's dad uh, so please remember him uh, Eric Embry had eye surgery today it went well um, he's starting to have, it seems like, some good progress, but it's going to be a long road for him. So please remember him. This is a, He's had a number of surgeries on his eyes, so please remember him um, and all that he is going through and the family as well. Uh, we have a number of those that are going to be having surgeries upcoming, certainly Cindy Skinner, Kevin Mullins, uh, Jack Greenwood. There's just others that will, will be as well. So please just check on one another. Remember Brandy McCarty's dad um, as hopefully he continues to to strengthen, and so please remember him. I um, want to make sure we announced um, about Chris Allendick, my, my mother-in-law. Uh, she was moved to a memory care facility yesterday. Um, won't let you know when she's able to have visitors, but please remember Rick and Chris and the family in your prayers if you would. Obviously, it's a difficult time at the at right now, so please remember uh, them in your prayers if you would. Remember Mark and Kathy Lyons? I know they were hoping to, to be here. Um, they're moving or moving to uh, Louisville or down to Kentucky, Louisville area. So please remember them. Um, they'll be, I'm sure, back up to uh, from time to time. But please remember them as they are, are moving and, and all that goes with that. And certainly grandchildren will pull you in various directions. So certainly uh, thankful for to have them here, but obviously understand why they are moving. Uh, group three will be this week at the Gallagher's, so please remember that. Thursday morning class is here tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Um, there's a devotion at Tom Taylor's house beginning at 6 o'clock Saturday. And then our gospel meeting begins April 28th, and so we're about a week and a half out. So please remember that with Jeremy Bard. And there's a meal list. As soon as you go out to the right, please sign up for that if you would like to have him over. Um, certainly would appreciate that. Uh, elders, are there any other announcements? need to be made oh I did want to announce there was a lady that's come a few times she had come with the Gallagher's from where the Gallagher's are living um, she had passed away and so she had come a couple of times and so we'll make sure that everyone knew that as well she uh, unfortunately has, has passed away so please uh, remember the Gallagher's and and her family and your prayers and this time we'll be led in closing prayer let's pray Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us and this night that you've given us to come out and learn more about you. Um, we pray with those who are unable to be here, um, those who are sick and struggling with things. We pray that you'll comfort them and be with them. We pray for those um, who have been going through things and are here. We pray that you also comfort them. Please be with us throughout the rest of this week. Uh, we pray that we can be lights in this world and representatives for you. And Mr. Jesus.